This winter, we're examining the life of one of the Bible's true heroes, the life of, of David, in a series we're calling How to Be a Person After God's Own Heart, because that's how God thought of David and how God referred to David. And wouldn't you like to be known in that way? Wouldn't you like it to know that God looks on you as a person after his own heart? Well, what does that look like? What does that even mean? We're going to uh, be working on answering that question uh, over these next couple of months. Now, what we learned last week is one, one thing that does not impress God. Remember what that was? The world prizes beauty, prizes strength, prizes success and intelligence and wealth. If you have any of these things, you're important in the world's eyes. We'll call you an influencer. And we'll follow you. But from God's lips to Samuel's ears in last week's story, we'll flash this verse, you'll remember it, 1 Samuel 16. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks where? On the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. The outward things are fine. We're not saying they're not fine. Do your push-ups. Do your work. Do your homework, work hard, chase your dreams, build a family, build your career. But the most important thing in life is what's going on in here between you and your maker. Are you seeking him first? Do you love him the most? Are you giving him your best? All this David had in place. And it didn't matter to him that everybody else around him, including his, his own family, thought of him as weak, as, as young, as powerless, as unpopular. That didn't matter to David because he knew he mattered to God. And if you know that, then nothing else matters. What a shield this is to our hearts to know that, that we and God love each other. So this, this week and next now, we're going to shift gears and we're going to examine the relationship that David had with Saul, who was the first king of Israel, and he's the one that, that uh, God is going to replace with David. If we want to know what uh, a, a person is like who has a God's own heart in them, it's important that we study Saul because Saul has a defective heart. We could say that Saul was, uh, was a man after Israel's own heart. He was the king that Israel thought it needed. And so what God does is he gives Israel a good long dose of Saul so that when David comes along, they'll see the difference. And we're going to hang out this week and next with King Saul that the same thing might happen, that we'll see what a defective heart looks like. Now, just as an aside, you may be wondering, how is it that Israel came to have a king in the first place? If you know anything about the Old Testament then you know that from the time of Moses until now, and we're talking several centuries have elapsed, Israel has had no king. After Moses and Joshua, Israel was led by a series of leaders called judges. And we see as, as you read these parts of the Old Testament that God would raise these judges up seemingly at random. There was no judge dynasty that arose. The judges all came from different places, different tribes, different families. And the scriptures make it clear that God wanted, the, wanted it this way. He wanted Israel to trust him as their king and not place their trust on any human sovereign. This is the way he wanted it. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we then read the story of how the people of Israel had had enough of doing it this way. And they demanded of Samuel that he set them up with a king. 1 Samuel 8, chapter 5, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. And here's what's, what's very interesting. God in his grace allows it. He says to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And God let them have it their way. We see these places in the Bible where God will reveal to us his perfect will about something. But then because of our sinfulness or because of our stubbornness, we say no to God. To borrow from C.S. Lewis, when we won't say to God, thy will be done, then the time will come where God will turn and say to us, okay, thy will be done. And he'll give us what we want. It's still sin that we're doing. It's still hurting us. But God lets it go to work on other things. From the beginning of creation, marriage was to be between one man and one woman for a lifetime. It's right there at the beginning of our Bibles. 
Well, by David's time, if you know David's story, polygamy was everywhere, including Israel. Israel just had to be like everybody else. And we're going to see in David's story that he had multiple wives. And then Solomon, his son, I don't even know what you call that. And yet, as you're reading the story, it seems as if God is looking the other way. God's perfect will is for one man, one woman, for a lifetime. But he permits other things for a while because the culture is too far gone. Our hearts are way too hard. But here's the thing. We can't look down at them and shake our heads and go, those people. Because you know what? I think the same thing happens with us. If we could see the full depth of our sin right now, if you could see the full depth of your sin, as it really is, right now in one glance, or if God were to deal with our sins, our full sin, and deal with it all at once, what do you think would happen? It would crush us. We couldn't bear it. And so the Holy Spirit, in the work of sanctification, picks his battles, so to speak, in our lives. And so he allows things that are unholy in our lives to continue to work on later. You think that that little addictive behavior that's been bothering you, you think that's your Goliath. You think that's your great sin. Oh, no. There are roots to that sin, and that sin has cousins and family members and friends. And in time, down the road, Jesus will walk alongside you and have you to face them. But not now. You're not strong enough. The same is true with the wider church. Do you think the wider church completely follows the perfect will of the Lord for it? Do you think that, that that's going on? I mentioned Martin Luther King Day. Do you think the Lord's perfect will has been for the church to be divided up in black and white for 2,000 years? Do you think that's his perfect will for us? Not a chance. But because of our sinful hearts that always wants to be around other people who are like us and fears the other, this is what happens. And so what does God have to do? He has to patiently work over time with the church, the wider church, draw us away from our sin and move us toward that more perfect vision of what the church ought to be. Martin Luther King had a dream, which is very much a reflection of God's own dream for us, where one day members of every tribe, tongue, and nation will be standing before the throne of God, worshiping the Lamb of God. So when you read about Israel demanding a king and God going along with it, this is how you ought to understand it. And so for a season that lasted about 400 years, Israel would have her king. 1 Samuel 9, then, is where Saul is chosen. Now, because of the, we're going to be looking at many chapters over the next few minutes, so I'm going to give you a sampling of verses. Uh, we won't read directly straight through. Uh, so let me summarize some of the key notes in these chapters. So one thing is sure, Saul was not looking to be king. On the day that Samuel crossed paths with him, he was looking. Uh, let's not hold these. I'll, I'll call for the slides as we, as we read them. Saul, anybody know what Saul was looking for on the day that Samuel crossed paths with him? He was looking for his father's donkeys. That's what he was looking for. And while he was on that errand, Samuel approaches him and says to him in so many words, your donkeys are fine. God has bigger dreams for you, young man. And it's interesting how chapter 9 describes Saul. We touched on this last week. Now let's, and I'll just call for these as we have them. Saul was a, a handsome young man. There's not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And then in chapter 10, Samuel anoints Saul as king before the people. Chapter 10, verse 24 says, and Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There's none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, say it with me. Long live the king. Oh, come on, act it out with me. Long live the king. Israel, here's the thing. Israel had looked around all the nations and she was jealous because all their kings were strong and big and muscular. They looked the part and they wanted that too. 
See, most of the people in Israel did not have hearts after God's own heart like David. All they thought about was outward appearance. And Saul looked the part. This is why we say, you've heard me say this before, that God will give a people not the leaders that it needs, but the leaders that it deserves. And if our hearts are bad as a nation, watch out. A lesson we need to remember as we move forward into this year. Then in chapter 11, God does even more for Saul. He helps Saul get his feet wet for kingship by having him lead Israel in battle to rescue a city that's being bullied by the Ammonites. And Saul summons Israel to battle, and as he does, he cries out, Follow Saul and Samuel. He's so careful to give God credit for what's going on. And he wins the battle. And it solidifies his leadership in front of the people. The people who doubted him as king, who didn't want him to be king. Saul forgives publicly and he says, says this, Today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. So far, so good. So what's defective about Saul's heart? Well, we're going to continue his story and find out. We're going to talk about two traits this morning. And then we'll add a third next week. And here's trait number one. In a time of testing, you run from God rather than to God. In a time of testing, you run from God rather than to God. Now, if ever there was a man who should never have forgotten that God was with him, it was Saul. When Samuel first meets him, Saul comes right out and says, Why are you choosing me? I'm the least of the smallest tribe in Israel. Saul had no shot at greatness until God in his grace stepped in and chose him. That right there should have filled his heart with faith. That right there should have caused him to say, wow, look at all that God has done for me. When a person first follows Jesus, if you can remember how it was for you when you first became a Christian, it's glorious at first. Your life goes from black and white to living color. You're on cloud nine. You're in a honeymoon phase. Some of you may be experiencing that right now. You've met Jesus. He's forgiven you of your past. He's given you a, a new lease on your life. The idea of you sinning, of you going back to your old life, is as detestable to you as eating a can of dog food right now. Ain't going to happen. But anyone who has walked with Jesus for any length of time knows it doesn't continue that way, that a wilderness is coming. It's a spiritual law. You can't get your promised land without going through the Red Sea. Abraham has a vision from God, followed by a desert. Israel gets deliverance from, from Egypt, miracles, pillars of fire, and then sand, thirst, heat, scorpions. Jesus is baptized. The heavens open up. The Father speaks to him. And then radio silence, hunger, and 40 days of Satan beating up on him. Times of testing will come to every worshiper of God. And we need to understand why this is. Because it's part of the deal. And we need to know how to face these, time, these, these times. Why do tests come? A couple reasons. First, it's a way of life on this side of heaven. We live on a cursed planet among broken, sinful people. The honeymoon is the exception. The honeymoon is God's way of keeping ordinary life away from us for a while so we can discover how good he is and start to cry out to him and seek him. But life, ordinary life, nod your head if you agree with this, it is full of tests. In fact, Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren just came right out in his book, Purpose Driven Life, and he said life is a test. It's not full of tests, it is a test. And he wrote those words before his wife was diagnosed with cancer and before his mentally ill son took his life. There are no pain-free passes for anyone on this broken planet. It was 20 years ago in November that a 13-year-old Christian surfer named Bethany Hamilton lost her left arm to a tiger shark off a beach in, in Hawaii. I, uh, I'm not sure I would have responded as Bethany did to that. They made a movie out of her story. Maybe you saw it, Soul Surfer. Good movie. Heaven broke into this life when Jesus came. Heaven broke into this life to show us what to live for and what to reach for. But this life is not 
heaven. Not by a long shot. There's a second reason why tests come. To make us stronger. Christian saints in the Middle Ages called these seasons, they gave it a special name when God seems to disappear off the map. They called them, anybody remember? The dark night of the soul. Why does God put us through such times? The saints said, to see if we will learn to wait faithfully on God. The sun beating down on, on, on wet concrete helps to make it firm. The barbell pressing down on the weightlifter's chest causes the muscles to throb, tear, and grow. The butterfly that has to push its way out of the chrysalis is able to fly higher and further. And so in chapter 13, Saul gets his first test, and immediately he forgets everything that God's done for him. The Philistines, who are Israel's fiercest enemy at the time, are about to attack. Saul gathers Israel's army to fight them. Now, here's the deal. Samuel is on his way. Samuel is going to come and offer a sacrifice and pray for them before they're to go out to battle. And Saul is to wait for Samuel until he arrives. And only Samuel is to offer the sacrifices. I'll be there in seven days, Samuel says, so just wait. It's a simple thing on paper. Wait seven days. Put me first. Put God first. The battle is the Lord, so don't go out and fight without him. Samuel doesn't come on day three. Day four, day five, day six. And what do you think the Philistine army is doing while they're waiting? It's getting bigger and bigger. Till they're as numerous as the sand on the seashore, the, the story says. The Hebrews are seeing this and they start quaking with fear. We pick up the story in verse 8. Samuel waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. How do you think Saul did with this test? Next slide. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offerings and the peace offering. Everybody say, uh-oh. Next verse. So Saul offered the burnt offering. Only priests and prophets were authorized to give the sacrifices. Kings were to know their place, and this is not it. And guess what happened immediately after he offers the sacrifice? Just take a wild guess what happens. Next slide. As soon as he has finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. <laughs> Awkward and very foolish. And Samuel says as much, verse 13, you have done foolishly, Samuel said. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God, which was commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. Saul, if only you had waited, if only you had trusted God in this test, you would have grown stronger. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Next slide. The Lord, and here we go, drum roll. The first mention of David in our Bibles. Your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Wow. Now perhaps you read that story and you think, wow. No grace there for Saul. God's giving up on him rather quickly. But come on. One tiny little test here. After all that God has done... In, in, in Saul's life, and he forgets it. And it's barely a test. Samuel is not late. If you remember your Lord of the Rings, a wizard or a prophet is never late. They what? Come precisely when they are. Yes. I've watched enough of those singing shows, American Idol and The Voice, to know that sometimes all you need are a few notes to decide whether you have a singer or not in your midst. Yes? If the moment life turns on you, the littlest bit, you start copying an attitude with God. You slam shut your Bible. You blow off going to church. You revert back to sinning. Brother, sister, this ain't going to be good for you. Jesus expects more from you. You got to be tougher. You want to know why David was a person after God's own heart? 
I'll tell you why. Because Samuel anoints him to be king by command of God. We read the story last week. And then David proceeds to spend the next decade running for his life out in the desert being chased by Saul who wants him dead. For David, for the next 10 years, it is test after test after test. But you know what David did all that while? He grew. He grew in his faith. He grew in his knowledge of God. He grew in prayer. He grew in worship. He grew in holiness. He grew as a leader. And unlike Saul, not once did David say to God, Oh, you're not with me. If I'm going to be king, I'm going to have to do this myself. Not once was that David. So confident was David that God would fulfill his promises. That twice David had the opportunity to take Saul out and kill him himself. And he refused to do it. Because Saul was God's anointed. And I will not lay my hand on God's anointed. David said. He was in a cave. He's right there. All he had to do was plunge in the sword. You know what he did instead? He cut off a little piece of Saul's garment. So that later he could hold it up to stall from a distance. And see, I had you. Saul's heart wilts at the slightest sign of hardship. A little test. And he says, nuts to God, and he starts taking things into his own hand. David's heart, all in with God. Whether it's sunshine or shadow, summer or winter, doesn't matter. He's experienced enough of God to know he's going to come through. And David would later write these inspirational words in Psalm 27. And I love these words. Read these aloud with me. This is how David ends Psalm 27. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You say, Pastor Barry, you don't know how, how hard my life has been. I have no doubt your life's hard. I know your life has been hard because life is a test. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Psalm 90 says that the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. The problem is you assuming that yours is a special circumstance, that you have it worse than everybody else, so naturally you have good reasons to turn from God. In fact... God owes you an apology of sorts for the life you've had. Well, then how do you explain the post that Bethany Hamilton made just a couple weeks ago in November on the 20th anniversary of losing her arm to that tiger shark? Here's what she wrote, and I'll read it for you. You won't be able to read it there, but 20 years later, she wrote, this was the location of my shark incident as a 13-year-old girl. I'm in awe of how much God has made beauty out of something so scary and so awful. When we face challenges, it can be hard to have hope beyond our chaos, but it is essential. I hope that my life can be a hint of hope for you in the challenges that you face. I see the challenges along the way as a call to live in faith and to trust in God to carry me through it all. I'm so grateful to God for his faithfulness. Life today, I have an incredible husband, four amazing children, one super strong arm, she says, and a body that still allows me to surf and do my thing. I see so much goodness through one of the hardest moments of my life. Thank you, Jesus, she writes. I think Bethany Hamilton is showing us a little sign of what having a heart after God's own heart is like, don't you? I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person that when the time of testing comes, I run to God. Grab hold of him and hang on tight, not let go. Well, chapter 14 gives us a second story in the life of Saul, which reveals a second trait of a defective heart. And we'll finish with this lesson. In a time of indecision, you do what seems right to you rather than seek God's wisdom. In a time of indecision, you do what seems right to you 
rather than seek God's wisdom. Now, the Philistines are like a bad villain. They keep showing up. They're like Penguin and Batman, if you remember that. They're like, who's a constant villain of the, Mar of the Avengers? Uh, like Thanos, never goes away. And they're back. Chapter 14 begins with the Philistines, again, mustering their forces. Now, the first part of chapter 14, you should, and you should read these chapters on your own later on to fill it in the details, tells a story of Jonathan, who is Saul's son. And Jonathan has a good heart. And, and, and Jonathan is angered with the Philistines having an outpost in their land. And he goes off alone with his armor bearer to see if he can do anything about it. Jonathan, in many ways, has a heart like David. And in fact, providentially, they're going to come together and they're going to develop an incredible friendship. We're going to talk about it in a few weeks. Nick's going to help us with that. Jonathan has that, that kind of heart. He wants God to be the center of his life. He wants God to be honored. And he's, and he's full of faith and trust for what, can, what God can do in his life. But he doesn't want to be rash. He doesn't want to take things in his own hands like his father does. And so in that, the story, Jonathan seeks God on what he should do. And he asks God for a sign. God then provides the sign to to Jonathan, who then heads out with his armor bearer in faith to raise a ruckus. And pretty soon the entire valley is filled with the sound of swords and screams and battle. Now, meanwhile, all this clamor drifts back in, filters back in to the Hebrew camp nearby where his father is. Saul hears it, grabs his sword, puts on his gear, he's ready to plunge into the battle, and then he goes, wait, 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 I gotta seek God, I gotta remember that lesson from before. Battle is the Lord's, and he calls for the priest to come with the Ark of the Covenant. This is, this is weird. There's some weird elements here. You remember the Ark of the Covenant, Indiana Jones, you know? Indiana Jones is fictional, but the Ark was real. And back then, this is really going to sound a little odd, but the high priest used the Ark as a way to discern God's will in, in, when tough choices needed to be made. And here's what that would happen. The priest would stick his hand in the ark, and he would roll some dice, I guess they were, or lots. They were called Urim and Thummim. Say that ten times fast. No one names their kids Urim and Thummim. I don't know why. Why doesn't everybody use that name? He would roll the dice, cast the lots, use the magic eight ball, and, and God would reveal his will. So when, when Saul was saying, summon the ark... He wants, he wants to know what God has to say about this. You might, and you might be thinking to yourself, man, that would be cool to have the ark, to have something like that and know what God wanted you to do. They were lucky. But don't think that way. The Bible actually teaches that the ones who are lucky are us who live on this side of the cross because we have three things that they did not. We have the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts. We have the full counsel of the Word of God in our hands. And we have Spirit-filled brothers and sisters around us at all times. And today, when we seek God for wisdom about a given situation, these are the three things that we use. What a gift you and I have been given. We get a real three-dimensional relationship with God. They got a wood, gold-plated box and some dice. Okay, back to the story. So Saul at first does the right thing. Here's the noise of battle. Going out, says, priest, come, brings the ark. Chapter 14, verse 18. So Saul said to Abijah, the priest, bring the ark of God. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. Somebody say, uh-oh. What do you think Saul's going to do next? He's going to hang up the phone on God. Next verse, so Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Enough of this malarkey is basically what he's saying. We don't need this. We don't need these religious rituals. And he proceeds to bark out orders for his men who start chasing the Philistines. Now, in the story, God is gracious, and they win the battle, largely because of Jonathan. But the writer here wants us to see the gaping, bleeding defect in Saul's heart. Jonathan sought God for direction on what he should do. But in his father, with his father, in his heart of hearts, 
This whole matter of seeking God's wisdom was too long, too tedious, too much of a bother. So he did it his own way, relied on his own wisdom, and this will be his default setting the rest of the way. And in time, this is going to catch up with him. Saul literally will become mentally ill. We'll see him just collapse before our eyes trying to figure out life on his own without God and his wisdom. And my friends, dear ones, you agree with this? That's usually how the way it works when you try and do life without God. If we try and solve the puzzle of life without God, sooner or later, life will break us. And if we don't succumb to mental illness, then, then we'll give way to depression or despair or anger or addiction or bitterness. Life just cannot be figured out without God. Meanwhile, Jonathan and David, these two who will become bosom friends, these kindred spirits, they have a different sort of heart that yearned for God. Both had an instinct to seek for God. That was their reflex, to put Him first, to commit their day-to-day -day lives into His hands, to not strike out alone without Him. David's son, King Solomon, would later write these famous words from Proverbs 3, but I'll bet you he heard them first from his father David. Read them aloud with me if you haven't memorized them already. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Mm. People who live like this demonstrate that their heart is moving in the right direction. And my friend, is that describing you this morning? Is that verse describing you? Is that your reflex? Do you know that each day that you're given is a gift from God? And so do you open each day up in His presence by having your quiet time? And if you don't have time for your quiet time right then, are you just pausing to seek Him first? Commit your day to Him. Your work, your family, your words. Do you then go out in the day and live it in His presence? Do you talk to Him throughout the day? Do you enjoy Him? Do you love Him? Do you reach out to Him? Those daily offices, we call them. Do you practice the presence of God with you? When you have a decision to make, do you turn to God right then and there and you say, Lord, I, I really need some wisdom right now. This is the direction my heart is leaning in. What do you think? And do you give God an opportunity to say yes, no, or slow the roll? When you come across something challenging as you're going through the day, do you pause and say, Jesus, I could really use some help right now? Give me your grace as I go into this meeting, as I make this presentation. I've got to have this difficult conversation with this person. Please help me. When you see something good happen as you're going through the day, or you see something or hear something that lifts your heart a little bit, do you pause right then and there and say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you are so cool. If these are the reflexes of your heart, that's good. God's working on your heart. Keep it up. Keep growing. But if these are not your reflexes, if, if life is generally something that you do on your own, and you just go out there in your own wisdom and strength, and God is seldom a thought until Sunday rolls around. Well, you have two paths in front of you this morning. What we've shared with you this morning is a tale of two hearts. Saul or David. Choose one. And then imitate him.